It's game week. Welcome into the Atlanta Enquirer podcast. Jeremy Warner and back yet again for another season. We are so happy he's on board for another season with us here at Atlanta Enquirer. It's former All-American linebacker, Illini great, Jay Lehman. Jay, we're five days from football as we record this podcast. How are you feeling, man? feel phenomenal. I always think there's an, everybody's undefeated, right? And you know, if you've been an Illinois fan, there's no better week than the first week of the year, right? Because there's lots of possibilities. And if anybody can hype up the possibilities, it's me and you, right? At least in our own mind, we might not share it verbally, but um, I think we always feel like the sky is the limit. Will it be a special year? You know, Illinois fans can count their special years on one hand, 63, 83, 1990, uh, 2001, 2007. We're due for something, you know? So, um, I think people are uh, excited about I'm getting used to the week zero game. I think we should do it every year. Why is that, Jay? I, I think so, too. I know Brett Bielma loves the extra off week, but wh- why do you think so? Well, I, 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 there's there's a lot of benefits, right? When I start practice a week earlier, okay? So I, I get a whole extra week of practice and an extra bye week, okay, for, for guys. And, and injuries are going to happen. You're going to need guys to rest and whatnot. And you can make uh, – it's easier to make adjustments in season, Right. Uh, Number two, you have a leg up on your first conference opponent. You get to play one game, and they don't get to play their first game until they play you. In this case, it'd be Indiana on September 2nd on that Friday night game, right? And number three, you have all the eyes on you, really, uh, for this week. I mean, there are some games, but we're one of the bigger games that are being played. And so I'm excited about the week zero. So all those things gives you great exposure. And... um, you know, and, and number four just lets the fans get into it a lot earlier. You know, back when we were kids, they had a couple games like the pigskin classic and the kickoff classic that they don't have anymore. And that was like one or two weeks before. And it just kind of gave you a little taste of football, which uh, in college football, greatest sport in the world. Yeah, I'll probably ask you more about this next week uh, is getting Indiana. But you did say like Illinois has the advantage of playing week one compared to Indiana. Like Indiana's got sure. new coordinators, two new coordinators. Yeah, Walt Bell. Yeah. And, and Illinois obviously has a new one. So there'll be film on Barry Lunny's offense um, sure. with Illinois. Like, So do you think actually just playing a game from a player perspective is better than having film of the other team? Sure, I, I- I, I do. I mean, maybe you make an argument with the Nebraska game where we, you know, last year, supposedly in, in week zero, you know, nobody knew what Ryan Walters or what Tony Peterson was going to do. And I think there was some benefit to that. But I think where Illinois is at, especially with a brand spanking new quarterback, any any game you can get under under your belt initially uh, is going to help. And people always say, you know, there's the kind of that coaches and they talk about hey, make your most important from week one to week two. So we're going to make a lot of improvement from week one to week two. And Indiana's not going to be able to play week one um, or week zero, rather. And I'm not so much concerned about Walt Bell. Well, there's a ton of tape on Walt Bell's offense, right? I mean, he was UMass. uh, He's the offensive coordinator for for Indiana, for you fans that that don't know. Um, I mean, he was at UMass as a head coach, but he's also in the Big Ten at Maryland for a couple of years, for a year or two. And there's a ton of tape on what, 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 what Walt Bell does. And so I don't think he's going to be much different at Indiana. Well, Jay, I, I want to get into all, <clears throat> all of this, the schedule, kind of the big picture of sure. the season. Um, but I want to ask you as a player, you know, year two of a new staff, like you're, you're a player, all of a sudden your coach gets fired, a new one comes in. You had experience with that. What, what's different? I, I know there's a new OC, there's, there's a new special teams coordinator, but the head sure. coach is the same. The DC is the same. Most of the assistants are the same. What's different for the players right now? Well, there's a couple of things that are, that, that are different. Offensively, it's a totally different rhythm. Um, not only is your practice and the drills that you're doing different, okay, but also um, the cadence of, of, you know, the snap count, but also the, the, the way the coordinator, you know, offense is so rhythmic, right? And so the whole tempo of the game, the, the, the way the cult plays are called, the way that um, Barry Lunny calls stuff is totally different than Tony Peterson. So I think that's a big difference, right? Um, if I'm a defender, there's not much that's different. If I'm just a, a regular guy, Brett Bielema's uh, fingerprints are all over the program. I think if I'm a specialist, I know, um, you know, Coach Snyder's taken over for uh, Ben Miller. Uh, it, it, well, well, Ben is, is going through some health uh, challenges, prayers and thoughts with him. But, um, you know, I think the specialist, I think that's where we're going to see the biggest change. And not necessarily in coaching-wise, but just 
uh, in personnel wise, right? Because, uh, you know, James McCourt's gone. Caleb Griffin sounds like he's finally going to get his chance. I know he struggled a little bit in the spring. Um, and then I, um, I, we got another Aussie at the punter right now, right? I can't remember what his first name, what his name is. I'll get yeah, it though. 20, 29 year old Hugh Robertson. Yeah. Yeah. He was like a, he was like a police officer in, in, in Australia and whatnot. So I think that's going to look different, but, but here's the, here's the mark of a good special teams is that when your special teams start getting really good and they've been good, largely on the legs of McCourt and Hayes, not necessarily the guys that were playing it, but those legs were special. Um, it shows a depth that's growing in your program when your special teams gets better as far as your coverage units, kickoff return, kickoff, punt return, punt. And I think we're going to see that. So I think we're going to see a, a, a more uh, a depth built football team. I think there was um, a lot, largely there was a notion out there, Jeremy, last year that last year was going to be the year because they had all these seniors and whatnot, more seniors than everybody. And this year was going to be the drop-off year. And I feel like that talk's kind of settled a bit just because some of the wins they got in Juco and the transfer portal and development of some young players and the defense's capability to keep them in games last year says, Hey, maybe, maybe not so much. Maybe we actually have a chance this year to maybe improve what we did last year. I, I don't want to put too much pressure on Barry Loney Jr., but Jay, I, I keep going with the take that I think he's the most important person in the athletic department this year. I, I just sure. think given what football means to an athletic department, given how much the defense improved last year, um, you know, Barry, there's a lot riding on that hire, but obviously he comes in with a lot of success and we saw it last year in person. What do you think can be his impact in one year uh, on this football program? Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. So we're talking year one. We're not talking down the line as far as developing a quarterback. I mean, we won't get into that. Nathan Shields has been the last guy we recruited that actually played quarterback here, right? I mean, everybody else has been a transfer since then. We don't have to go through the list. It's already well documented. But I think in year one, it's the ability to throw the football. Um, so if if Tommy DeVito or whoever the quarterback is, Arts at Kelsey, we don't know, hasn't been named yet. But if they could get five first downs to the air more than they got last year. And then two scrambling around with a quarterback run or something. That's seven more first downs. Now let's say that a third of those are in critical situations. Uh, meaning you get one or two first downs in a critical situation that lead to a field goal or a touchdown. That would be the difference in at least two games last year. Right? So like we, we if, you, if you break it down, so, I think on a very um, numbers oriented, that's what he can do. I think we're looking at five to seven more first downs. Minimally. <laughs> Hopefully that's, a great, way more. that's a great way of looking at it. Cause we look at points and that, that all matters, Jay, but yes, you are right. One first down against Maryland, one first down against Purdue. That's the difference. That, that's a seven win potentially special season around here. Exactly. So, I mean, it, the way I see it is out of every, you know, out of all your first downs, you get one third are going to be critical first downs, meaning they're extending the drive. They lead to points. Maybe they take more time off the clock and it's, they've called the money down for a reason, but there are definitely, you know, with 13 minutes to go in the first quarter, that, that first down is not nearly as critical as eight minutes to go in the first, in the fourth quarter with, you know, a three point lead or, or, or vice versa. Right. So it is a very important thing uh, as far as getting first downs. And I think throwing the football, um, is so important when people know we want to run the football. I mean, Chase Brown put up some enormous numbers on stacked boxes. Josh McCray had a great season as a freshman with, with stacked boxes. What's it going to do when we actually can, I don't know if we can stretch the field yet. I mean, that, that's a long, that maybe that's too, too much of a, you know, a chasm to get in year one, but I do think we can keep the defense honest more, right? And one thing I saw what Barry Lenny did when we saw him uh, up close and personal in the UTSA game is he's very matchup driven. You know, he would just have his quarterback um, check to where the matchup was favorable and really win those one-on-one -on -one battles. And if the matchup was favorable to, to, to run the ball, they ran the football. So I think he's going to coach up his quarterback to have options on what to do when they look at the defense, what can we do and have confidence in that quarterback to throw the football. So, Jay, my follow-up question to that is, uh, I would expect Tommy DeVito to be the starter. Uh, we're recording this Monday morning before the press conferences, and I don't know if BMO will announce it, but I would be shocked if it's not Tommy DeVito. Um, wh what are your expectations for him? Uh, and, and you sure. mentioned it. I mean, Chase Crouch had some starts. Riley O'Toole right. had some starts. But this has been a revolving door, and he's part of it. 
Uh, but his sure. job is to kind of be the bridge guy and get Illinois to post sure. season so they can recruit better quarterbacks and all that. Maybe it's a transfer, whatever. What yeah. are your expectations for him? And what do they need him to do? So uh, that's a great question. Well, let's not forget that, um, you know, Tommy was beat out at Syracuse, you know, didn't work out well for him. It didn't work out the way he envisioned it and he's here. So, uh, but as far, as far as this year, what can he do? I think number one, where Brandon Peters, you know, had some athleticism. I think he had some leadership, but, but I think where Illinois really needs it is just in the accuracy department. Number one, you got to be accurate. I mean, I think Brandon had a great arm, um, just sometimes struggled with accuracy and, and to his defense, didn't necessarily have all the time in the world. I mean, you look at that Wisconsin game, no time to throw the football, right? So, um, accuracy is just number one. Can I put the ball on the money in a critical situation? You know, I'll talk about a Purdue guy in Drew Brees, uh, probably in the bottom half of arm strength in the league of NFL quarterbacks that he's the most accurate quarterback ever, right? And a Hall of Fame quarterback. So accuracy, when it comes down to it, it's not so much how hard can you throw it? How fast are you? Accuracy, number one, and those critical third downs. Number two, uh, we, we got to have Tommy... Uh, especially if they're going to run what I saw, some out of the pistol and also some out of the uh, shotgun, um, you've got to have a little bit of quarterback run mixed in there. And so I don't think it's necessarily a huge part of the game, but I think it's three to five runs a game. And can you pick up one or two first downs doing that, right? And open up and be accounted for it so there's one less guy to tackle with Chase Brown. And then number three is just the leadership aspect. Like you got to have a quarterback that's going to look you nine and say, look, we're going on the field. We're going to score and we're going to win this game. And uh, guys that and people that guys respect and, and do that. I think that's where, um, although Art struggled with some stuff last year, I think even being banged up, he seemed to have more of that on-field leadership that they were looking for. I'm not in the huddle. Brandon could probably have that, but it, it does didn't necessarily show it sometimes. And so I think that on-field leadership is the big thing as well. And that dinging you guys here is that I just don't know how to turn off my text messages when I'm on a call with – uh with jeremy uh warner so i couldn't even know. i couldn't even hear it so it was okay good. Good. I, I agree with you i think tommy uh accuracy and a swagger uh i, I just think brandon lacked that so like i don't know if i'm putting too much on brandon because you said it like the support around him wasn't great sure the play sure. calling around him wasn't great but there was times where you were in a rut offensively you need your quarterback to to lift everybody up and i just yeah can, can tommy do that i think that's gonna be one of the most important things so it's like an intangible thing jay but you as a player probably know it too, right? Yeah, I mean, I think um, we always, I always hate to rag on players, especially offensive players, you know, so much is on the offensive line, right? And, and, I, and I would say this, I think for as veteran a group as they were last year, I felt like the offensive line underachieved a little bit in the pass protection uh, realm. And, and I think losing Doug Kramer hurts. Um, I, but I think we also have some, some bookends with, with Palcheski. I think Julian Pearl, did he move to tackle? Is he going to be guard? Yeah, he'll be a left tackle, yeah. Okay, so he'll be at left tackle. You know, I think you have two potential NFL guys there. You know, at least we'll get to camp. I think Pearl will be a draft pick, but but I think Palcheski will get to camp. Maybe not get drafted because of the injury history there. But I think we it, it all it all starts there, right, on the offensive line. And so I think if we can shore that up, I think we're going to have better quarterback play. I also have a lot of confidence. Barry Lunny Jr. You know, he's going to start forty games in the SEC at Arkansas as a quarterback. He's coached a lot of football. I think he had six or seven years in, co in college coaching, then about eight or nine years in high school coaching, coached at Bentonville, Arkansas, a great program in Arkansas. And, and then, you know, he's got back into college coaching and, you know, kind of a, kind of a rising star at UTSA. Uh, and, and to get him mad, I, I'm, I'm expecting about that. I think the, the big question I have with not seeing these guys is I, I don't know who they're going to throw the football to a lot. <laughs> I know Luke Ford has, I, I think he's been banged up a little bit recently. Um, I know Isaiah is showing some flashes. He's just a small target. Will Hightower get more reps this year? Well, you know, I, I don't know. I know they've, they've recruited decent at that position as well. So Daniel Barker at Michigan State is now, so he, he's not an option. So there's a lot of different things that I have questions about when it comes to the pass game. Can they run the ball as effectively as they did last year with that new look uh, offensive line? I think so. I, I think they have a chance to run it better. And the reason they have it, run it better is because you have uh, people – have to respect the pass, hopefully. Um, we haven't seen that, but you have to respect the pass and you have to respect a running quarterback. I've, as I've always said, football comes down to numbers, right? And so when the, when the, uh, and math, and uh, when, when a quarterback just uh, is under center and hands the ball up to running back, it's really nine on 11 
because I have nine blockers. One's carrying the ball and the quarterback's just standing there watching. But when the quarterback can run, it becomes 10 on 11, right? And the reason we have pulling guards and whatnot is we're trying to get numbers over on one side against the defense so that I have a, this is coach speak, a hat on a hat, meaning that I have a blocker for every defender, or I put, you know, the one free guy, the safety in the open field against Chase Brown. And I'm, if I'm a betting man, I'm going to say Chase Brown more often than not is going to be good enough to make that guy miss. And so it's really putting your guys in position to get numbers and then have your athletes make plays. I do think they're going to run the football well. Um, And I do think you'll see more of McCray and Chase Brown on the field together. I think they're too good not to have on at the same time, especially with the offensive skill players we have right now. Yeah, and I'm interested to see, Jay, if they get involved in the passing game more um, because I, I felt like that was, you know, if you don't have great receivers, uh, get get the running back sure. in some way in, in space. And I think Isaiah Williams kind of the same way. Get him in space and, and find a way because I think he could have a monster year, Jay. Um, Isaiah, sure. if they just find a way to get him enough touches. Sure. I mean, the easiest throw in football should be a five-yard, uh, you know, in or out option route to the slot receiver. I mean, it's short. It's quick. Uh, can your slot get open? I think Isaiah can do that, right? Uh, so I think he could have a huge year in that regard. I think Chase Brown, um, just from what I've seen, probably has more of an ability to be a receiver than McCray does right now. Um, but I think McCray could be a beast in protection with his body if he gets in and you, know, you can really play a role in that. Uh, and so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised to see Chase Brown um, split out a little bit in space and whatnot. And so there's all kinds of different options. I think you hit the nail on the head if there's three guys that – that come to come to mind when it talks about offense it's it's isaiah williams it's chase brown and it's mccray it's zero one two right i mean that's basically the numbers right zero one and two and uh those are the guys that are going to get a big chunk plays for us all right jay let's switch to the defense which was obviously such a a great story last year sure such a huge turnaround yeah before we get into what this year's group is we've talked about this on the podcast before but just to reset this for people that didn't hear your take on this what made Ryan Walter so successful in year one and his staff, right? Like what, what, why were they successful with the same guys? Lovey Smith was not the year prior. That's a good question. You know, I think up through the Virginia game, I, I don't think they were much more successful at all. Right. But I think they showed an ability and maybe this is a benefit of the extra bye week too. Cause I think they had a bye week around that time to make some adjustments and say, you know what? what we've been doing is not necessarily working. And I remember talking to Ryan Walters at the time and just said, Hey, really put our guys in the best position to do what they do best. And what we saw was, you know, the transformation of moving Sidney Brown into what I would call a classic monster man position, meaning uh, in the old school, high school defense of the, the, the four, four defense with, you know, a corner, a corner and a safety. uh, He was like the strong safety. And that he's that monster man that would roam all around and kind of change the look of the defense, number one. Uh, number two, uh, he started game planning specifically for teams, which is a, more of an NFL, th- uh, NFL thing to do. And I think the best example is that when they went on the road in Minnesota and, you know, we knew the, the RPO was going to be a big option with the run pass option. And uh, they basically said, we're going to stymie, we're going to stop the run, and we're going to put people right in those windows where you run, run the slant. So Sidney Brown was right there, just in the slant. Kirby Joseph and Witherspoon sometimes were right in that window. Sometimes they backed up um, the linebacker. Of, uh, sometimes uh, Tariq Barnes would be backed up in there. So, I mean, it was it was interesting how he kind of game planned. And then number three, and I, I just don't think this can be stated enough, they got much better play from the defensive line. Uh, not, on, not only on the interior, right? I mean, because like, you know, Johnny Newton and Keith Randolph and, and Roger Perry last year, there was, that was a solid rotation of three defensive tackles in there. And I think Johnny and, and Keith are going to be mainstays for a while. But really the growth of Owen Carney and Isaiah Gay getting pressure uh, consistently, that was huge, right? And I don't know what, 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 the, what, what, what light bulb went off, but they weren't the same player the last eight games of the season than they were their previous four and a half years. And I think I'm, if there's a point of concern for me, it's who's those outside, who's going to rise up as an outside linebacker to get pressure and also to to really take pressure off of our line. You know, linebackers are only as good as their defensive line. So uh, I, I'm interested to see at the outside linebacker what, what's going to happen. 
Yeah, I think Seth Coleman has got to be that guy, right? Like we've seen right. glimpses. He, he beat out Isaiah Gay, and as Kevin Kane likes to say, he didn't lose the job. He just got Wally Pipped. He got hurt and uh, got yeah. replaced, and Isaiah Gay played fantastic the rest of the way. But he's 6'5", 240, right? It, it's his time. It's his fourth year. Sure. A guy like Calvin Avery, Jay, uh, we've been waiting to bust out. It sounds like he's in right. a good camp, slimmed down. Yeah. I saw a picture of him. He looks thinner. I know that. (laughs) Relatively, right? I guess. Relatively, yeah. And then, you know, you think of a Taz Nicholson who's replacing Tony Adams. You think of a Kirby Joseph um, who leaves and now Kendall Smith. Uh, Ezekiel Holmes replacing uh, Owen Carney. Like, these are guys with experience, Jay, but now they have completely different roles. It's going to be really important to, to maintain that standard. Those guys all have to step up. Yeah. And, and I would not be surprised, you know, if we see, um, at the backer position, and I know uh, these guys have kind of flowed, but, but Jared Beatty, Malachi Hood, I don't know if, if, they, if, if they're going to play or whatnot, but those guys are decently touted backer athletes. Um, there was another guy. Gay Backus is a monster. Uh, Gay Backus, that's it. The guy out, the guy out of Florida, right? Um, you know, who I think we could see these guys get in. And so um, I think it wouldn't be surprised when I saw some of the bodies they brought in that by the end of the year, some of those guys are starting based how it goes out. There's going to be a guy that's the Kirby Joseph of this year. I don't know who it's going to be, right? But there's going to be a guy you're like, wow, we didn't see that one coming. There always is every year. And, um, you know, I think that guy for me, even though he had a solid year, is going to be Johnny Newton. Uh, I think Keith got a lot of the pub last year, and, and rightfully so. I, not, not knock on Keith, but I think Johnny's looking phenomenal. Uh, and, and what I saw in the spring and, and a chance to talk to the coaches about, you know, when, when Keith was out a little bit, just what Johnny was able to do. I, I think Johnny's going to make some big, big strides. So I'm excited about that. What is it about him, Jay, that, that makes you think he's that level of player? Well, I, I first saw the, the coaches like to talk about playing with extension and, and what, what that means, is basically playing with your hands and not letting an offensive lineman get into your body. But what I like about Johnny is he's rarely out leveraged, uh, meaning that he plays a lot lower. Now he's a shorter defensive lineman, but but he plays with great leverage. So you re- rarely see him get bounced out of the line. Now, if you ever see a linebacker or a, a defensive lineman get bounced, you feel like they're just kind of get shifted out of the hole. Usually they're playing too high or just not strong enough. I rarely see Johnny with that on the point of attack. I feel like where Keith has been better is he's longer. He's able to get off blocks a little bit better. But as far as being a plugger and a guy who plays with great leverage and has a great motor, I really like Johnny uh, in, in that regard. And so I think great leverage, his ability to play with a great motor and effort, and it's just his ability to plug stuff up. I rarely see him get pushed back. That's what I like about Johnny. And I think, remember, we've seen him play as a freshman and as a sophomore Usually those are not great years for a defensive lineman. And so I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to see what Johnny Newton can do. What do you expect from Ryan Walters? You expect wrinkles? Do you expect him to build off something? Cause he, they get more of their guys that they've recruited. They have more time in their system, um, more time to know their personnel. So do you expect, how do you expect him to kind of approach this year? Just do what we did last year. It worked or add wrinkles to it. Yeah, I think one, you're going to see him trust his guys more so. So you're going to see guys, you know, if Sidney Brown's out there and sees something, he's going to give him the green light to do it because guys are going to be more reactive than thinking. But I, Ryan Walters reminds me of a guy that's a rising star. And I don't think he was just um, watching old game tape over the last year. I think he's saying, uh, what can we do better based on who we're playing in our schedule? What do we want to show this week as opposed to what do we want to say for Indiana next week? Um, and most importantly, how can I, you know, people often think about the offensive coordinator getting the ball into a playmaker's hands, but you've also got to put your defensive players in the best chance to make football plays. I thought they did that with Kirby Joseph playing free safety and Sidney Brown really playing strong safety. I felt like they did that with Devin Witherspoon, having him have a chance to tackle on the edge and also compete in man-to-man coverage. I thought they did that with Owen Carney and trying to create one-on-ones with Owen Carney, right? I thought they also did that, uh, you know, in in the short time where I saw Calvin Hart play in Nebraska, where they said, okay, hey, we're going to blitz Calvin Hart because he's a good blitzer, right? And so it's about putting your guys, uh, your job as a coach is to put the guys in position to make plays. At the end of the day, if the guy doesn't make a play because he's, you know, 
you put him in position, he just misses the play. We need to recruit better players or, or he needs to make a better play. But uh, I think they're going to feel more comfortable in that regard. So, Jay, what, what are your concerns? Like, you on this season, like, what, what are your concerns that could hold Illinois back from – I think the obvious goal is, is to make a bowl here. Sure. So, uh, I think what I'm, been, I'm terrified of when it comes to Illinois defense is the big pass play. I know they were way better the last eight games of the season, but if we look at the last five years, <laughs> there have been so many gaping – holes offensively I mean uh, defensively on huge pass plays and so there's no quicker way to get out of a game than to give up points like they did in the Lovey Smith era and just be depressed the reason we were excited to watch this team is because it was a game until the third fourth or ninth overtime right so um, th those are the reasons that we were excited about it. so I I'm always concerned on the back end when you lose your free safety and Kirby Joseph and that's being replaced you lose Tony Adams some veteran guys. So, um, I, and then we lose our defensive ends, which, or outside linebackers rather, which basically help your uh, defensive backs the most because they create less time and more pressure on the quarterback. And so those two factors, I'm concerned about our past defense, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's num number one when it comes to concerns. Uh, and number two is, uh, I look at the offense, I'm still concerned about who we, who are we throwing the football to? Um, I think Barry Lenny's got the X's and O's. It's yet to be seen if he has the Jimmy's and the Joe's at the receiver position, but I'm sure somebody will surprise us. I think schematically they're going to try more things to pass the football in, and I think they're going to have better protection. And then third, my, my, my other concern is that um, James McCourt and Blake Hayes erased a lot of shortcomings offensively and defensively by putting us in great field position or maybe getting us field goals in that area where our offense seemed to stall between a 33 and 43 going in. Um, they were able to get points on the board or they were able to pin the, 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 the offense back, the, the opponent's offense back. They erased a lot of mistakes. Um, I'm concerned that maybe the level of play for the specialists might not be at that level in year one. And so I think on those on all three phases, those are what I would say I'm concerned about. There's always the things with, you know, we talk about this every year. Illinois is not in the position or hasn't been in quite some time, especially in the senior people that have a lot of depth. And so can you stay healthy uh, is a big question, especially on the front lines where I feel like we're always lacking depth, offensive line, defensive line, defensive line, we're getting more depth, but um half of staying healthy is getting through camp. And it, it sounds like uh, we don't have, we're not privy to a ton of information, but uh, I guess we'll find out, you know, I'm sure there'll be one or two guys that don't dress for Wyoming that we don't know about now, but it sounds like overall they made it through, through, through camp in a fairly healthy manner. Jay, before we get out of here, uh, I want to ask you about just the Wyoming game. But uh, before that, just season as a whole, the schedule, you get Wyoming, Chattanooga, Virginia, all at home for the non-conference. Your crossovers, sure. Indiana, that seems favorable. Michigan, Michigan State, maybe difficult. Michigan, I think it's more so Michigan State. I think Michigan State regresses a little bit, I think, uh, though they're a very talented team. Uh, and then you get the West. So given that schedule, like what, what would make a successful year? What are your expectations? Yeah, I mean, I think a successful year when you have a five-win season the previous year is, is bowl game or bust, right? I mean, I think that if you go back and you, and you finish five and seven, um, you'd be a little salty, right? I don't think it'd be the end of the world, but I think that be, you'd be a little bit salty. Uh, I think when you look at who you have at home, despite what Virginia did last year to Illinois, um, Illinois is a totally different defense and they got a totally different staff with Tony Elliott now being, being a coach. So there's going to be some turnover and, and that's only going to be their, their second game. That'll be our, our third game again, uh, you know, uh, kind of a, a, a heads up on both those, those first two power five opponents, I should say. So I feel really optimistic. Uh, I think the Indiana game is going to tell us a lot. Yeah. Every game is going to tell us a lot, but I think that your first conference opponent, I don't care if it's Indiana or Ohio State. It, it tells you a lot. Um, so I, I, I like to be an optimist, you know. I mean, if Purdue got nine wins last year, think about that. Purdue, a team that we have always looked at, along with Minnesota, you know, Purdue and Minnesota, we've looked at those teams and said, shoot, we should be just as good as those teams in football, and we should be just as good as Purdue in basketball and better than Minnesota in football and basketball, right? So something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And And – we have not been lately, but those teams got nine wins last year. So if those teams got nine wins, 
I'm not sure seven wins is out of the question. I, I, I'm not. I mean, the, the level of parity in the Big Ten uh, West is, is, is always there. I don't know if it's going to be there in 2024 with USC and UCLA, but it, it, it certainly is there right now. And so um, I think it's there for the taking. USC, UCLA, I got to ask you, what, what do you think? You, you've, you've been one of the few players to play in that Rose Bowl. Yeah, so uh, interesting. Uh, I actually think it was a great move by the Big Ten. I think it's a survival move, right? I mean, a move. I mean, um, if the SEC is going to bring in Oklahoma and Texas, okay, which are two pretty big programs, uh, well, UCLA and USC, you know, uh, USC is just as big as any of those programs. UCLA probably not as big as Oklahoma, but um, it's a big grab. And I think we're all well on our way to becoming um, – two power conferences, Fox versus, you know, ESPN, ABC, basically. Uh, although, you know, with the, new Wars. Ten, with, 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 yeah, with, with the new, with the new big 10 deal, you know, they have, uh, they've got, you know, Fox in there, then they've got CBS and they've got NBC. And then the next one's going to go to FS1 and then you're going to get big 10 for the rest of the game. So, um, but I think it's going to, it's, it's only going to expand. Um, you know, I've got my eye on, I would love to see Stanford come in. I think academically that makes sense. Stanford's won more national championships in any sport than any other school. Uh, people talk about Washington, Oregon, but man, I tell you what, having Stanford in makes sense. And to me, that's kind of a prize school to get. Uh, I mean, I'm not just talking about football, basketball, women's basketball, volleyball. I'm talking about all sports uh, and, and academically that really raises the, the bar of, of the school. So of the conference rather. So I think that's the big fish to get other than Notre Dame, in my opinion. And uh, I'm looking forward to see how that fleshes out. I think in the next five years, it'll all be done. We'll all see what it's like. And then they're going to fight for more realignments after that. It's a natural, I think it's a natural fit, Jay. Stanford, um, I know Notre Dame's a big one. Oregon's a little sexier, but I, I agree. I think Stanford makes a lot of sense. All right, Jay, keys to the game against Wyoming. What do you want to see on Saturday? I'll tell you the first to know, I don't know much about Wyoming at all, but I do know that, you know, Craig Bowles is still the coach, right? Yeah. Uh, he's won a lot of football games, a lot of national championships at North Dakota State. Uh, they're going to be prepared to play. I mean, that's – he's a good football coach. And Wyoming's a team that historically has beaten some Power 5 teams in their history, right? Um, I think whenever you play the state university of any team, uh, there's a lot of pride there and they get good players, you know? So um, I think it's going to be a good game. Uh, I guess what I'm looking for, and this is, this is such a defensive thing to say, but it's, it's about turnovers. You looked at what the turnovers did in that Nebraska game, how that changed the game and taking care of the football. So I think turnovers, number one, number two, uh, who can run the football, right? I mean, who can dominate the run? We know Illinois is going to try to establish that. And, and number three, so many games are lost because of mistakes rather than plays made. And so the mental part of it, um, not jumping off sides, not holding, playing with great technique, and coming down to protecting, protecting, protect, protect the football, protect the quarterback. So those do not sound like sexy things. But I tell you what, man, if Illinois can do that, and not give up the big play, uh, they'll be fine. Yeah, game one against a lower-level opponent, a respectable one, right, but a lower-level sure. opponent who's lost a lot to the transfer portal. Like, you just want to see clean football. If you play clean football, you feel like you should, right. you should beat that team. Yeah, I remember that now. It was Craig Bowl who said, like, his whole team left in the transfer portal or something, something crazy, right? Two, two quarterbacks, star running back, star wide receiver, star corner, star edge rusher. So they, they're, they're resetting. So I, I, I think you're right. Just play clean football. I think you should come out – with a, maybe not an easy victory, but a victory. Jay Lehman, pumped to talk football with you all year, man. Uh, glad to have you back and can't wait to, to break down an actual game next week. Let's do it.